Situated at the mouth of the Irwin River, some 350 kilometres north northwest of Perth, lies the tiny coastal community of Dongara, the self-professed lobster capital of Australia. But about four decades ago, it was an entirely different creature that had captured the attention of two biologists who were working in bushland just outside of town. These biologists observed that male jewel beetles had developed a sexual attraction to the empty beer bottles that had been left behind in the bush as rubbish. And what was happening was that the brown shiny surfaces of these beer bottles were bearing a striking resemblance to the brown shiny four wings or the elytra of the real female beetles, but with one notable exception. And that is that beer bottles, of course, are much larger than real females. So the beer bottles were acting as a super normal sexy stimulus, attracting the males to the bottles. And in this example of unrequited love, the males were paying a very high price indeed. The biologists observed that some of the males were actually being bitten on the soft portions of their genitalia as they were trying to mate with these beer bottles. Now, while the idea of beetles on the bottle might seem a little amusing at first, it does highlight a growing environmental problem. Sex, even at the best of times, is a challenging pursuit. Charles Darwin in The Origin of Species came up with the concept of natural selection to explain the evolution of traits, including behaviours that are driven by what he termed the struggle to survive. But of course, Darwin recognised that merely surviving isn't enough. Animals also have to reproduce, and he came up with the concept of sexual selection to explain the evolution of traits that are driven not by the struggle to survive, but rather by the struggle to reproduce. And biologists nowadays recognise this sexual struggle as a potent evolutionary force responsible for much of the weird and wonderful diversity of life on the planet. So sexual selection, for instance, is responsible for the evolution of sexy ornamental traits, such as the bright colours and the elaborate courtship displays that we see in male birds of paradise. It's also responsible for the evolution of weapons, such as the antlers that we see in stags, which males use to fight one another for access to females. And in most species, it is in fact the males that are the more competitive sex, and they'll vie with one another for opportunities to mate. And females, by contrast, tend to be highly selective about their choice of mating partners. And we know from research that females can acquire a whole range of different benefits by being highly choosy. So for instance, we know that in some species, females will choose males that can provide superior territories or access to good food, and in other species, females would choose males that are going to be good fathers for her offspring. In other instances, females select males that can confer good genes to her young. So it's not hard to imagine that the operation of sexual selection, things like mate choice, can not only determine who actually gets to mate, but also the quality and quantity of offspring that are subsequently produced. And this, in turn, can have consequences for population health. We also know that reproduction, including reproductive behaviours, are finely attuned to the environments in which they've evolved. So an important question to ask is, well, what happens when environments change as a result of human activities? Well, on the one hand, there's evidence to suggest that uh, human conditions might provide a lot of novel opportunities for animals to exploit, including in a reproductive context. A good case in point comes from the forests of Eastern Australia, home to the satin bowbird. Male bowerbirds build these elaborate architectural structures out of twigs, and they also decorate the cord of their bowers with all kinds of found objects, such as fruits and flowers. And in areas close to human habitation, birds have started to innovate and also have started to incorporate found human objects, such as bits of colourful straws or glass. Further afield, in Europe, another species of bird called the black kite has started to incorporate white plastic rubbish into their nests. And it turns out that the amount of white plastic is actually an accurate signal, telling all the other black kites important information about the quality of the nest builder. And in Central America, in cities, birds have started to pick up discarded cigarette butts. And it turns out that the chemicals that are present in these cigarette butts, uh, the toxicants, uh, also act as very powerful pesticides that can deter the proliferation of blood-sucking parasites. So these birds, by incorporating these cigarette butts into the nest, can actually improve the offspring survival. But unfortunately, it's not all good news, as we saw in the case of the beetles in Western Australia. And there are many examples where human activities have had a detrimental impact on animal reproduction and sexual selection. For instance, we know that many species of birds and frogs sing to attract mates. 
And in noisy urban environments, birds have had to adjust the frequency of their songs so that they can be heard. So they've had to elevate the pitch of their songs so they can be heard against the low frequency din of urban noise. And in some areas, birds have even had to adjust the timing of their song to avoid the noisiest times of the day. And while there's evidence to show that some bird species are able to make these kinds of adjustments, unfortunately, other species such as the European tree frog are not able to adjust their song. So their songs risk being drowned out by urban noise. And it's not only urbanization that's a problem. Global warming is also having an impact on animal reproduction. So for instance, in some migratory bird species, there's now a mismatch between the timing of the arrival of migration of these birds and the peak availability of food that these birds require to feed their nestlings. Invasive species too can be a problem. In North America, a species of bird called the red cardinal have started to nest among the branches of an invasive shrub called the Amur honeysuckle. And the reason for this is because the Amur honeysuckle produces lots of carotenoid rich fruits that the birds love to eat. And at first this might seem like a good thing until you consider the fact that the open branches of these shrubs actually make the nestlings more vulnerable to nest predators. So by nesting in these shrubs, the parents actually suffer reduced offspring survival. And my own research in Central America showed how chemical pollution of the environment has resulted in female swordtail fish no longer being able to discriminate between the smell of males of their own species and males of a closely related species. And as a result, females were actually making mistakes in mate choice and mating with the wrong species, resulting in the loss of biodiversity. More recently, members of my research group and I have been looking at the impacts of pharmaceutical pollution on a whole range of ecologically important behaviors, including in a reproductive context. So most of us would appreciate the therapeutic benefits of the medicines that we take or that we give to our pets or to our livestock. But what's not very well appreciated is that vast quantities of these drugs actually make their way into the environment. The reality is that most modern wastewater treatment processes, whilst very good at removing the solids and the nutrients, haven't been designed to remove toxicants such as pharmaceuticals. And so they do end up in the environment. Some of these drugs are known to interfere with the normal hormone functioning of animals. And an infamous example of this is the contraceptive pill in UK rivers, which has been implicated in the feminization of male fish. Members of my group have been looking at pharmaceuticals such as the contraceptive pill, various antidepressants, and even hormonal growth promoters that are widely used in the livestock industry to help animals to bulk up, to help improve meat yields. And we've looked at how these drugs can impact reproductive behaviors. And we've found all kinds of disruptions, including to male uh, courtship displays and also female choice and sexual responsiveness in aquatic organisms such as fish. Now, based on these examples, it's easy to become pessimistic about the impacts of humans on the natural world. But I believe there's also considerable opportunity to harness this information to affect tangible conservation and management outcomes. So take the example of pharmaceutical pollution. Now that we know that even minute quantities of these drugs in the environment can impair reproductive behaviors in aquatic organisms, hopefully we can harness this information to affect tangible regulatory changes and also maybe change the way we treat these uh, sewage before we release them back into the environment. But the fact remains that human-induced changes to ecosystems everywhere and the impacts on biodiversity do pose urgent challenges. And in this context, it's really important to try and figure out why some species are able to thrive under human altered conditions while others flounder. As we've seen, hu human activities can have all kinds of negative impacts on reproduction and sexual selection, sometimes for the better and other times not. And it's important that we now harness this information to affect practical uh, management implications so that we can uh, make a tangible benefit uh, in this rapidly changing world.